thank you everyone for being here. I was saying that I was not quite prepared to give a presentation like this. I'm so used to Zoom. You're gonna have to bear with me if I fumble or make mistakes or uh, say the words wrong. In any case, my name is Ramin Kine. I am the core lead of Athena Doubt, the decentralized collective looking to fund women's health research. Let me start by saying that I am not a scientist. So I am the living proof that you can, um, I'm a great example of how with decentralized science, you can organize around causes that matter to you. I have experience launching and growing consumer business and have worked with luxury brands like Louis Vuitton and consumer tech companies like Apple and Amazon. It was in my advocacy work in longevity that I became obsessed with menopause and here we are. I'm, you, I'm sure you have heard about the infamous Valley of Death a log from BioBio actually mentioned it in his uh, first presentation today. For those in biomedical research and biotech, the value of it is an important theme. A friend yesterday actually said that pretty much everything in biotech is in the value of death. Not to my friend. But I actually did go up and look up the, um, the definition. And the value of death in R&D is it's used to describe the period of the development of a product or service when a significant increase of investment is required, making the risk of failure much more likely to outweigh the potential future return. When it comes to women's health, we're nowhere near the value of death. That's not a problem we have the pleasure of having. So rather than tell you about how criminally underfunded women's health research is, or how, um, I'll tell you more of the horrible stats such as how in 2020, 10% of the NHS's research funding went to women-specific conditions. I am instead going to, going to make a case for how ignoring half of the world's population is one of the silliest mistakes in innovation and business that we are making in modern times. When you think that 1% of healthcare research and innovation is allocated to female-specific conditions, you can imagine that we're living a lot on the, on the table. From uh, for example, menopause and its associated symptoms are not capturing global disease burden databases, which looks broadly at causes of death, disease, injury, and health risk factors. We're leaving a lot on the table. From contraception to menopause, basically anything that affects the odds of you being here. Because if you're not a woman, you have a girlfriend, you have a sister, and you have a mother. And speaking of mothers, this meme is, made, is going viral right now on Instagram, and it says motherhood is not every woman's calling. And I added to that meme, but menopause will happen to all of them. Again, when you think of the total addressable market, you're thinking of half of the world's population in this one condition in women's health, menopause. I did say that I'm obsessed with menopause, so you're going to hear a lot about that. But women's problems are not, do not sound sexy. Who really wants to talk about menopause? And if that's not your jam, if your thing is solving big world problems, you have to think that we're heading for an infertility crisis. Or how about something more incredible like an open source artificial womb? And as, if, as everything starts with science and technology, there is a unique opportunity in change to work in women's health from the ground up with decentralized communities, empowering researchers, and changing the current paradigm. Since no one is paying attention, there's a lot of opportunity. It's like a open, um, it's like a blank page. From uh, things like standardized women's health data sets, computational biology focused on women's health, academic publishing, and as I said, what about an open source artificial womb? At Athena Dow, we're first focusing on the areas of research that are most underfunded, such as ovarian aging, menopause, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and biomarkers for all of these, as well as endometriosis and uterine fibroids. So when I mentioned that 10% of women's health research goes into women's health, of that, 1% goes into these conditions. But given that half of the population will go to menopause, if you actually kind of do a very basic math, things don't really square. As a progress to date, uh, we were selected as the first cohort of BioXYC, which uh, we were very honored about. We've already uh, presented an academic, uh, at an academic 
conference. And we just recently published a reproductive health report, which is actually our first public good. It was thanks to a Web3 tool, Gitcoin, that we were able to do this. We've uh, onboarded about 10 to 15 active contributors in academia, venture, and research. And we have also run a series of talks with the leaders in the space. More importantly, and something that I'm very, very proud of, is that we are already evaluating projects from institutions such as Harvard, Cambridge, and many more. We come with the support of many uh, biotech and research institutions. And our goal is to become the leading global community-enabled platform driving translation and transformational women's health research, education, and funding. So with that said, we're actually going to have a panel on women's health research. And I have two amazing uh, scientists with me today. I'm going to get them to come on stage. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So to do the women's health research panel, we're going to start with the panelists introducing themselves, and then we're going to get going. Um, well, I started in biology and science um, through my passion and interest for longevity research, um, which was at the time very underfunded um, and very like obscure topic that you couldn't get funding for. Um, but I just wanted to do more, and that's why I did my uh, bachelor's in molecular biology and um, later on my PhD in aging. Um, and it so happened that my project um, was more geared towards reproductive aging. Uh, and it was um, astonishing to me how little we know about this area. Um, we we'll talk about it. Um, don't worry, it's such a good um, model to study aging movement because everything happens so much earlier, but that's um, recognized in that video. Um, and it was um, an astonishing area because there is so much more to be found out um, that can help so many people. Um, and now I'm, I've finished my PhD, uh, I've left academia, and um, I would like to help translate um, great research, both, both in uh, longevity and reproductive aging, um, to the people who need it most. So um, I'm currently working with Athena Dow and Gita Dow and more traditional VC um, who focuses on longevity projects. Hi, my name is Yulia Juric, and I'm a molecular scientist. And uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Gamos Bioscience Lab in Croatia. And actually, uh, we developed a blood test that can detect early signs of perimenopause. And we are looking to uh, develop um, it further to also evaluate the effects um, of HRP, so bone replacement therapy in women. Uh, um, my my current uh, position is uh, product development and I'm working on it uh, very um, actively, as you can see. Uh, and I want to bring you with help and wellness and longevity. Thank you. So you already know who I am, hopefully. If not, my name is Armin Kini and I'm the co leader of Athena Dow. Um, you hear that? There's not many use cases for Web3 for people who are not into Web3. And the reason I got into decentralized science because I thought it is really the best use case of actually tackling real world problems. Well, of course, that's what I would say because I'm into decentralized science. But I wanted to do kind of a live workshop um, to contextualize things. So I was around London and I went into a booth and I found this on the clearance bin. A menopause test for two pounds ninety nine. So basically, I said need to cancel the talk because our work is done here. Uh, I mean, two ninety nine for nine ninety nine and a menopause test that's supposed to tell me if I'm going to menopause. But I know that this is not real. But since I have scientists here, this is an opportunity for them to talk about why this is not real, why it's an opportunity if we actually get evidence based products, and why decentralized science can help tackle this. 
and also become, I mean, it's a massive opportunity because women are willing to take these steps because they're desperate when they're going through this in their lives. And we're selling them crappy products. Why would you could actually give them things that do actually work? So Maria, let's start with you. Why is this not real? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's real, but what does it actually tell you? It's a one-off measurement of FSH, um, which is what comes to any hormone. Um, and it is the hormone that's secreted um, from your brain, uh, from the pituitary, um, to basically signal the ovaries to um, grow follicles. Um, so it could indicate that you're entering menopause if it's very high, uh, but that's mostly because um, the ovaries start producing estrogen, um, and estrogen um, blocks the secretion of FSH. So if you don't have estrogen, that's what you could block it to get high levels. Um, but if that um, test actually tells you anything, it's very um, controversial. Um, because FSH levels vary constantly throughout your um, menstrual cycle, which is um, a fluctuation up and down all the time. Um, and it goes up dramatically when you hit menopause. Um, but that would be a very busy and important time. Um, so you can't do anything about it at this point. Um, so we already know you have menopause and you can kind of confirm it with that. Um, but it does indicate, I think, um, a big problem that these products are so needed um, and women in that kind of market around menopause um, and around people who are trying to conceive, uh, it's very exploited because um, they're desperate to find out and they don't have anything that's good enough to give us answers. Just for context, I think recently the menopause market and just what we have right now, not even actual real uh, solutions, is valued at $600 billion worldwide. So that's with what we have right now. But I think Julia can tell us more about how, why this doesn't work, it has to do with perimenopause. Yes, of course. So menopause, as a word, means uh, meno is menstrual cycle, and pause means stop. So it's uh, when you diagnose with menopause, it means that the woman hasn't had uh, her menstrual cycle for the past uh, 12 consecutive months. Uh, so uh, you're basically diagnosing something which is already, which you already have been gone through for the past year. But uh, what I wanted to say actually is that uh, today, um, this, um, this hormonal test uh, measures, your, measures your FSH levels. But your FSH levels uh, really vary a lot, and uh, they even vary within one day. So when a woman does this test of FSH during the day, uh, the levels could be fine, but when she wakes up uh, during the night, all sweaty, having her flashes, then if she does the FSH, uh, it could be very high. So they are not reliable because they uh, they have they vary, they vary a lot and. Although they're not reliable, the uh, UK government spends 9 million pounds each year for this testing. Why they do this? Because they don't have a reliable test. So how do you diagnose menopause today? You have to go to a doctors, you have to uh, do hormonal tests, you have to uh, accompany them with the symptoms the woman has. And often the symptoms uh, are quite similar to other diseases. For example, uh, women experience brain fog or they are having trouble sleeping. Uh, they experience anxiety and often get prescribed with antidepressants. But basically you're not fixing the core problem of women. Uh, and that is the hormone deficiency which they are going through before entering menopause. And this is a period which is called perimenopause. And perimenopause can last, it actually, an average lasts for seven years before one gets diagnosed with menopause. And now today we know that in the UK, it takes six doctor's appointments, and it takes seven doctor's appointments and six years to be diagnosed with menopause. And during the period, women suffer with all those adverse conditions. And what's most important, and what we see in our research, is not only the symptoms, it's actually what's happening on a molecular level, and this is increasing inflammation. And inflammation is 
is the root cause of chronic diseases. Okay, so everybody got a lot of education here on what's going to happen to old women as they get older. Uh, if you can imagine going through that, that's not something to look forward to. Uh, because I know the women that I've had it did not enjoy it that much. So it, it varies really. But one of the biggest things of why I got so obsessed with menopause is because I learned that women's um, cellular aging accelerates during this period. So it really affects our health outcomes. When you think of it at the turn of the century or before that, women would potentially die two to two, three years after having menopause because we will, our, life, they, our lives were much shorter. 50 to maybe 60 years if you were lucky. Now women are spending a third of their lives postmenopausal, and after menopause, there's an increase in heart disease, Alzheimer's, at, at risk increase in those diseases, as well as osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease. So women's longevity is greatly affected by this change, the biological change. Now we've changed a lot of things in science. There's no reason why we can't change this too. And this is what, where decentralized science can actually play a role because this, this area is looked by investors, but with solutions that sometimes are about just um, management, treatment, management of the condition, or, oh, here's your patchouli oil to like feel much better and power. Yay, love menopause. So when we're talking about when, we, when I said in the earlier talk that women's health is a massively overlooked opportunity is because there are very interesting problems to, ta to tackle with a huge audience that will be ready to try anything. Also, keep in mind that 90% of uh, healthcare decisions at home are made by women. With this said, um, I mean, as I'm working in a venture formation at uh, Apollo Health and being between Vita Dow and Apollo Health and at Vita Dow now, what do you think, Maria, are one of the areas that we can work with decentralized science to tackle the issue of menopause? Well, I think Bill is working on it would greatly benefit for having a community of women um, who have direct interests. Um, in the projects that will be funding, the research that will be supporting, and the outcomes of it. Um, and not only um, would they have the information, but they would potentially have ownership um, in all of those projects, um, which is what we're all here about. Um, so we are not only focusing on menopause, but a bunch of other very widespread conditions uh, from PCOS, um, endometriosis. Um, and we are in aging, which affects fertility. Um, and as uh, our lifespans, as you mentioned, are growing, um, our productive lifespan is staying the same. And with uh, our lives changing uh, and our priorities shifting, um, a lot of women are <coughs> faced with uh, the harsh reality um, that too much time has passed. There's nothing they can do anymore. Um, and they still feel so young, so energized. Um, it's like 40, 45 years, say, like you don't feel like you're in the prime of your life, and actually your system is entirely gone. Um, so I do think we need um, biomarkers uh, more reliable than this that are integrated um, in the healthcare system, um, ideally. And, as uh, customers, for example, they're given every year. Uh, you have to do it to track your progress. Um, and what we also want to focus on is therapeutics. Um, so we can do something about it. Julia, you know a lot about, about my markers. So please tell us more about the importance of them and what you actually are developing with Black and Asian men range. Um, thank you for this question. So um, basically, uh, what we were looking at is how to some kind of make or find a marker, which would um, go beyond this uh, hormone fluctuation. And uh, hopefully we've been in the live biology for the last 15 years. So we're looking at the uh, immunoglobulin gene, most prevalent antibody in blood and figured out that uh, the activity of this antibody changes as people are getting older, so it's become more uh, pro-inflammatory. And we made it in 
into a biological aging biomarker. And then we were tracking men and women, and we saw that men like um, age linearly, constantly, but women tend to be younger biologically, but until the age gap, just right before the menopause. Before menopause and in the end of the menopause, in the period of perimenopause, uh, women tend to age two and a half times faster. That means that their inflammation level, which we are measuring with uh, our glycogen test, uh, tracks the increase in chronic low grade inflammation. And this was something very significant for us. We thought that this was a big discovery because the inflammation, in our case, tracked by this biomarker, so IgG and glycans, like the technology, can uh, also track the decrease in production of estrogen, which women is going through. So basically, we are now developing a product which is called Nanobridge. And uh, by testing your uh, biological aging and the pace of biological aging, we can sense when uh, we can work as a predictive biomarker and can uh, tell you if you are aging too fast and if you are entering uh, perimenopause. In this way, we will make women be aware of something is going on and they can manage the inflammation and uh, they can uh, decrease the health deterioration and uh, live a more quality life in their years. So I just want to contextualize why we have a fan, uh, obviously a fan, uh, CSO of a femtech startup because there was a process that as you, as I might have mentioned, and Maria did say when you're presenting, presenting herself, we're both uh, Vita Da alumni. And as a matter of fact, Menu Age was a project that was also went through the Vita Da pipeline in terms of being up for uh, potential funding. It didn't work out, but as we did Vita Da, there's another opportunity and looking from another context. And why this is interesting in the second life science is because for instance, black and Asian men who age are not just uh, doing the the venture part of it, but they also have the research. And where we can play a role is in actually funding more research to get more data points so that the actual startup does better. One of the reasons there's not enough fanfic startups or enough funding is because there's not enough science. So science is everything when it comes to actually making progress. And one of the interesting things about a DAO is that we're not necessarily a fund. We're also not an academic institution. We're a hybrid of those things. And we can do things that funds can't do. And we can do things that academic institutions can't do because they're tied to the certain rules by their prestige or the things that they have to do within the context of their countries. Um, we have, for instance, contributors from Singapore, here in London, in the United States and hopefully we're gonna have more after this happen. But why we, why I thought using the menopause test, which is such an unsexy conversation, I know. All of you guys wanna talk about computational data and algorithms and uh, data uh, assets and all of this, and I just wanna tell you, all we want is a really good test that all these women would actually use if it was truly available. With that said, I know that a lot of people usually have questions about why a DAO, what are we doing, how are we doing it? So I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Any questions? Hey, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, and part of my ignorance if I'm missing the point here, is the like test to work towards eventually coming up with some kind of treatment uh, to prolong uh, the pre-menopause phase or, yeah. Well, actually, we are looking also uh, to treatment options, uh, which will be if the menopause, if you, think, uh, if you think of menopause as a hormone deficiency state in women, then the logical would be to supplement women of which they are deficient of. And this is estrogen, estradiol, and progesterone. 
And today we have a magnificent uh, product, uh, which are uh, body identical hormones, so 17 degrees per gallon. And we have a micronized progesterone. Uh, studies which have been done have shown that its um, use is transdermal, and this use, if uh, the dosage is, of course, as with the first ones, it, it uh, minimizes uh, any harmful things that you might consider um, connecting with the bones. Brilliant, thanks. Um, hi, thanks. That was super interesting. I just wanted to ask you when you said that you can do stuff that academic institutions can't do um, because of prestige and other, you know, constraints. What are those things? The main thing is being able to work with different research institutions. We're not tied to one, right? So if a researcher is in Singapore, they can do projects with us or based here at the at the research institution. If you're in Cambridge, you can still potentially maybe come and contribute to us and have another path to work on your projects. Yeah. So the bigger thing is not not the being tied, but the fact that we can be more collaborative. Yeah. So we don't have one particular institution that we have to work with or we're tied to, and that's the big thing. Yeah, and just another question: If you're a woman and you want to, um, you know, contribute to this or like, yeah, what can you do as a woman? So depend. I mean, every woman can contribute because, as I said, I'm not a scientist. But if you're a researcher and there's a spe a, a, something that you're working on, not even tied to necessarily the conditions that are that we're looking at, you could potentially be one of our scientific evaluators. Or we also doing a lot in terms of. Um, Publishing, we're going to publish a second reproductive health report. Um, we're looking for more contributors to actually start working with us in different areas. If you are not a researcher and you are a communications person, you can come work in our communications and awareness groups. If you are a venture capitalist, you can come and evaluate the research projects that we're looking at to see which ones actually have the most potential. There's so much that can be done, it's just we have to do it. Right now, we're focused on the science. We're really are focused on boarding the researchers, the scientists, the academic institutions. And we actually, when we actually do get proper funding and do more things, uh, actually have those the science very solid, our next step is actually the community. How do you actually reach women that are not researchers, scientists, the ones that are on Instagram finding information about their health? Because women's health information is not that readily available. How do you curate? How do you actually provide a service and actually make women realize that women's health research is so underfunded, it's actually a massive problem. Women don't know this for context. Um, so guys, don't feel bad if you, if you didn't know. Women also don't know this. So there's a massive education gap that even decentralized science has to fulfill. For us, it's another layer in trying to get everyday women into our community as active participants. Maybe for some of them, it's eventually when we have tokens or memberships, they can just join and say, hey, I'm putting instead of $5,100 to like this thing that doesn't mean anything, my money is going towards scientific research or getting better solutions to women. But the first step is join our Discord. It's too bad I don't have our page there anymore. And I skip that page altogether, but you can find us. On, you can find us on Twitter. Follow us. Share our share our mission to your friends, family, women in your life, men in your life that are into reproductive health or women's health. Um, and I'm oh, happy. So uh, proving the point that uh, men or many people don't know. Um, can I ask just a point of information question, um, which is, and then I'll ask the question, which is, um, uh, according to Jennifer Garrison's presentation on, on, on this topic, there are only four species, uh, three besides us, that have menopause. Is that correct? Like, yes, and they're mostly male, and they're all males. Yeah. So, <laughs> FYI. <laughs> so if that's the case, uh, and a lot of the science is remaining to be done, and you were talking about the therapeutic space. How do we actually uh, do the model organism testing? Like, how do we actually do some of the um, scientific understanding and testing 
uh, in, in labs to see if the therapeutics work or, or how things are working? How, how do we understand any of that uh, machinery? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so we could still do research in mice uh, that can be relevant, um, and there are a lot of things that we don't understand uh, that we need to do more research on. Uh, for example, why do ovaries age so much faster than the rest of our body? Um, uh, what actually happens? Uh, because when you look at the, the curve of uh, follicles or all sites in your ovary, um, they gradually decline uh, until you hit around 35 years of age, and then there is a steep decline. Uh, so what happens there? Um, is it some kind of a switch? Uh, is it just damage accumulation that creates a bad environment, so they start um, dying more and more? Is that sugar kind of a cascade? Um, and all of those questions, I think, are going to help us find out um, about potential therapeutics in space. Maybe that's the mice. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you could do. Uh, so, so, the why mice don't have menopause, uh, they're not menstruating species in the first place. Um, so, menopause is the cessation of menstruation. Um, but they do run out of eggs uh, before their lifespan is complete. They also decline in uh, reproductive function, so there are shared um, aspects of it. I just want to say that if you read our reproductive health report, we tackle that subject there because there are researchers, <laughs> embarrassing how we hear, but we do, there are researchers that are actually working on models that induce um, the process of menopause in mice. I think what we and the other Lauren that have your statement on. Um, yeah, the naked mole rats. And then the other thing on the reverse that Dr. Jennifer Garrison says from the Global Consortium of Reproductive Longevity, who is the biggest uh, consortium in the world right now tackling ovarian aging, is she points out how tackling longevity through ovarian aging makes sense because ovaries have a shortened span. So you could do longitudinal studies, you could actually do more. It makes sense that even longevity researchers start looking at ovarian aging as a really good model. I'm sure this is one of the reasons that um, our, why Maria was actually, she told me in her lab in uh, Australia, doing little, what was it with little mice? The in, insemination. So she can tell you a lot about how you work with mice. Um, did that, that answer your question? <laughs> Great, okay. Um, any more questions at all for the panel? We do have a bit of time if anyone, oh, yep, yeah, one over here. Uh, my question, so we talked about treatment options, um, the hormone replacement therapy and so on. Would there be a cure? Like, what would you do? You know, and I like kind of, you know, there is no, I, I just don't see a scenario where it's all game. What do you lose? You know, uh, so if you go with the hormone therapy, you know, what are kind of the things that you're giving up? or let's say you cure menopause, there is no menopause. What is it that then you would kind of risk having, you know, maybe like increased risk of cancer or whatever it may be, right? Well, um, first of all, menopause is not a disease. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we need to address that. It really, menopause is not a problem, just for puberty, it's not a problem. It's something you need to get through. And yes, that's right. So menopause is not a disease. It's a physiological process when a reproductive part of a woman's uh, life is ending. Uh, what the problem with menopause is, and especially perimenopause, is inflammation. So it is the part of the life where women experience increased very high inflammation. And inflammation is actually connected to Three out of five people die of inflammation worldwide. So it puts you in a it puts a moment in high risk of developing chronic diseases. Uh, cardiovascular diseases get five times um, higher risk. Uh, women get have five times higher risk of developing cardiovascular diseases. Uh, they have metabolic diseases, osteoporosis, osteopenia. Uh, and what we figured out is that we can, uh, we want to be uh, working in a preventative manner. 
So each woman will go through perimenopause and andromenopause. What we want is that the harm to the health of a woman is minimal during the period. So that woman when enters menopause and lives for the for 40% of her life be uh, healthier. So she has to be healthy, has to be active in society. Uh, this way the persons feel much better, she has a better health span. And uh, we save money for the healthcare. So uh, this is everybody's game. Governments and the woman uh, who is aware of this situation. Because now women uh, are aware that inflammation is happening in the body. They see all the symptoms and they think, okay, this will pass in five years. I can manage it, I can go through it. But what is happening is this health deterioration, and this is what we want to emphasize in women and uh, make them uh, actively act on preventing long term health consequences. I also wanted to say that we put a spotlight on menopause because it's just one area that has, I mean, half of the world's population going through it, right? But there are so many other things within women's health, like PCOS, endometriosis, um, me metabolic health issues, so many things to tackle that could actually improve women's health condition. And these are areas that maybe we don't talk a lot about. There's a big taboo around women's health. So even doing this today here and just slapping menopause here to everybody to listen to it, it's a challenge because people don't want to talk about it. They don't think it's cool. And if I can appeal to the coolness, at least I'll appeal to the fact that I can tell you there's a huge amount of money to be made on actually helping people, women have better health. And women are very good consumers. I don't know why we are, but if we, you were actually were giving us things that helped us, we would actually be happily spending the money because we already spend them on other things that don't matter. So I just say, well, this is an opportunity. It's not feel sorry for ourselves. I don't think so. It's that you're being very silly if you're not joining our cause. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I do, I'm, I'm quite interested in this topic because. I actually um, helped arrange HRT for my mum when she couldn't sleep um, when she was going through menopause. So yeah, I just wanted to know: was that uh, is that kind of where the work ends? Like, is HRT an effective treatment for menopause, or are we still looking for better options for women? Um, so I don't think HRT is a treatment for menopause. It's a great tool to manage menopause. Uh, but it's not something that treats the underlying causes um, and can like prevent it. Uh, but what we what would we consider a moonshot would be something um, that tackles underlying causes, so running out of eggs. Um, so we continue producing those hormones um, endogenously. Uh, so we want to find a way uh, of how to preserve um, the eggs in the ovary. But um, for this to happen, we need to um, have a bit of a forward thinking um, and start um, start this um, treatment, uh, if you want to call it that, um, at the time where we still have the eggs in order to preserve them. Otherwise, once you run out, there's nothing to do. I mean, think of it. Uh, we live around like 80 years now, and women live longer than men, but our reproductive system is in the cave times. So women are 25 years old, can't afford to have children, they want to have a career, and their most optimal time to have a baby is going to be 25 years old. This is like a big biological conundrum we need to tackle just to also, and that's why they call it the global consortium. Um, it has equality after at the end because it is an equality thing for women to also be have the opportunity to when they are financially stable when they're happy with their careers to maybe have children later than 40 which is not really a biological reality right now and as i said we have transplants we have viagra we have things i mean we live 80 because we have vaccines so we should have something for either extending or extending or ovarian um, life or putting it on pause or delaying it. It's just, 
It should be there too. Any more questions? So I'm good throw. Can you hear me? Hello. You can, oh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, which I think is a little bit more technical. Um, recently, Apple, uh, with um, with the release of the new watch, made a big deal of sort of not not big deal, but they highlighted the privacy aspect of the reproductive um, data, which you know um, the device was co was collecting. Given that you know there is a political angle to reproductive health. I'm wondering what measures are you taking to sort of keep that in mind as you sort of engage with people, uh, whether it's clinical trials or you know um, the eventual um, stuff that you build to actually help um, aid folks through. So thanks for that question because I know in decentralized Life Science we talk a lot about patients uploading their data and those things and when it comes to women's health there is an added risk but we're not right now currently working with the consumer so we're not going to be getting data from users directly we're working with research institutions and that separates the data layer from us in terms of privacy because the research institutions do have very strict uh, rules as to how data is collected and how it's distributed and who they can share it with and we would be abide by those by those rules now we also have the potential of working with startups. And we've had a discussion where maybe when one of the startups, they would, they, they would actually say to the user, would you be willing to give your data for scientific research? But that's something that you put there as a preamble. However, if you do work in Web3 and the blockchain, it's tricky because data in the US, it's the right to forget, so the HIPAA compliance, you're not allowed to take people's data and then actually have it on blockchain, which as we know, code is for life. So there are these are technical issues that we have to tackle. But from for the beginning, we're actually working with institutions and they're handling the first part of the data for us, not like an Apple or app, which they are taking input in. The information they're getting is what I would call the consumer. And we are not at that layer yet. Tell me in maybe a year and a half, and then we, I can tell you. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. That was absolutely fascinating panel discussion. Um, 